It's members' night this evening when our talks are provided by our own members and reflect their research interests and travel adventures. Our first speaker this evening is Linda Papanakua on the middle, medieval origins of Little Red Riding Hood. And our second speaker will be Bob Nyden with an update on the restoration of Notre Dame in Paris. He has been so good to keep us updated on this since the tragic fire. Our final talk this evening is a brief visit to St. Mary's Church in Woolpit, England. And Linda, if you're ready, it's all yours. So this is Little Red Riding Hood and its medieval origins. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing is take it, starting us from the present back. Ooh, it's coming on strangely because then I'm going straight into my second screen. Well, I have to figure this out. Okay. Uh, so um, this is uh, it, kind of in my capacity as a Monke art historian who turned uh, teacher, I've gotten interested in children's subjects. And so this is one. So what we're going to do is begin, not with the present, but sort of in the near past and present and then move back in time. And I will show you uh, the earliest sources of this and then sort of move forward and talk about it again. Um, the, the source that many of us may know are, are Grimm's fairy tales. I've uh, got on the screen there, uh, the first paragraph of the German version, a translation, uh, and I'll go, I'll read this part and then go quickly through the whole story just to jog everybody's mind. Once upon a time, there was a dear little girl who was loved by everyone who looked at her, but most of all by her grandmother, and there was nothing that she would not have given to the child. Once she gave her a little riding hood of red velvet, which suited her so well that she would never wear anything else, so she was always called Little Red Riding Hood. Now, bear in mind that... Um, if you look over on the bottom line of the German translation, it's not Little Red Riding Hood, it's Rotkäppchen, which really translates as Little Red Cap. Uh, there is a German uh, illustration right there uh, of a little girl from the story, and you will see that that's a red cap. And uh, we, what we uh, may think of as that long cape with the hood on it was a little bit differently from the German version. This is just one of the interesting things. Uh, the story goes on very briefly. Uh, if you remember that uh, mother gives Red Riding Hood a little basket of bread and wine to take to grandma who lives in the house in the woods, who's not feeling well. And on the way, Little Red Riding Hood encounters a wolf and she's so innocent. She doesn't know that wolves are dangerous. The wolf sort of chats her up, convinces her to go pick flowers and enjoy her walk. And so forgetting that grandma, mother told her not to talk to anybody else, eats grandma up, climbs into grandma's bed. And when Red Riding Hood arrives, remember, you probably remember this part, grandma, what big ears you have, the better to hear you with, my dear. It goes on through eyes and everything. Wolf springs out of bed, eats Little Red Riding Hood up. Then so full and satisfied with having eaten two women, he falls asleep, snores loudly enough to attract a woodcutter who comes, slits the wolf's belly open, releases the woman, and then gr with grandma's uh, sewing needle, they uh, stuff the wolf's belly with stones, stitch him up again. The wolf gets thirsty when he wakes up, falls in the creek, and drowns. And the moral of the story, as it ends, is the three of them sort of live happily ever after. Hunts, the uh, woodcutter skins the wolf, goes home with the pelt, grandmother eats the cakes, drinks the wine, and Little Red Cap thinks, as long as I live, I will never leave the path and run off into the woods by myself if mother tells me not to. And that's the moral of the story. If we go backward in time, we arrive at Charles Perrault in the era of Louis XIV in France. Now the Grimm's had been um, Germans, 
German folklorists, uh, since they were they were from Hanau in Hesse Kassel, and uh, they had studied and been become interested in folklore at the University of Marburg, began to collect them and began editing these uh, Märchen, House Märchen, in first edition in 1812. And this is probably the version that most of us grew up with. Although Perrault's version, which is earlier, is also very famous. In Perrault's version, there's a bit of the French text. You'll hear similarities in the beginning. Once upon a time, there lived in a certain village, a little country girl, prettiest creature who was ever seen. Her mother was excessively fond of her and her grandmother doted on her still more. This good woman had a little red riding hood made for her. It suited the girl so extremely well that everybody called her little red riding hood. Bottom line of the French text, you will see Petit Chaperon Rouge. So it's a little bit different. Illustrations that I have here are two from Perrault's early version on the left the frontispiece uh, because the title when he first published them in 1695, it was Contes de ma mère de uh, Lay, uh, which Mother Goose stories. On the right is a 19th century engraved frontispiece. The illustration for Little Red Riding Hood is at the beginning. Uh, Perrault was born to a wealthy bourgeois family well-educated. Uh, Perrault was an academician. Uh, he active in government service under Louis XIV's finance minister Colbert until 1686 when Colbert decided that all the functions that Perrault had been doing should could better be done by his own son. So Perrault sort of had a forced retirement and after that he devoted himself to his children and began to collect fairy tales or mother goose stories as he called them at the time. Uh, and uh, he, um, so Little Red Riding Hood is one of these, uh, first published, uh, it, well, the one on the left is in the Morgan Library, it's actually manuscript, 1695-ish in the 19th century. Perrault's version, it's important, is different. The wolf runs ahead, gets to grandma's house, gobbles up grandma, gobbles up Little Red Riding Hood, and that is the end of the story, the moral. Children, especially attractive, well-bred young ladies, should never talk to strangers, for if they do so, they may well provide dinner for the wolf. I say wolf, but there are various kinds of wolves. There are those who are charming, quiet, polite, unassuming, complacent, and sweet, who pursue young women at home and in the streets, and unfortunately, it is these gentle wolves who are the most dangerous of all. So what, um, what you see here is actually a rather distorted with some similarities, but rather differences. And that moral, uh, which, you know, is a little bit shocking, uh, remind that he was uh, instructing in part his own children. Uh, and it reflects that he had seen a lot during his time in the court and knew that French society for high-born young ladies was a fairly dangerous place. Perrault is generally considered to be the first, well, he's the first published version of the story that everybody knew, but he's not the oldest. And here we come to the medieval origins. This one has been published frequently recently, between 1022 and 1024, Egbert of Liege, who was a teacher of Trivium at the Cathedral School of Liege, this was in the time of Bishop Nutger, uh, Ed, uh, Egbert composed a long Latin poem called The Well-Laden Ship. It was for the moral instruction of his pupils. And he has a version of the tale, which is, again, somewhat different, but it has all of the essential elements, the little girl in red and the wolf. And so what, he's, what I have to tell the people in this country can tell with me. 
and it is not so wonderful. It is quite true to believe. In other words, he's saying right now, this is a folk tale that I got from the people around the countryside. Characters a bit different. A certain man took a girl from the sacred font, you know, the baptism, and gave her a tunic woven of red wool. Holy Pentecost was the day of this baptism. So you've got an association of the color red with the color of the garment. The girl, now five years old, goes out at sunrise, footloose and heedless of her peril. A wolf attacked her, went to its woodland lair, took her as booty to its cubs, and left her to be eaten. They approached her at once, and since they were unable to harm her, began, free from all their ferocity, to caress her head. Do not damage this tunic, mice, the lisping little girl said which my godfather gave me when he took me from the font. And here is Egbert's moral. God, their creator, soothes untamed souls. In other words, his moral is that the sacrament of baptism uh, protects you against um, evil or any rate, that sort of thing. Now, this is a very complicated chart that I've done up. And it is what's called the Arne Thompson or the ATU tale type com index. It used to be assumed that folk tales were ancient stories handed down and carried on sort of from ancient times. But there's now a recognition that popular oral transmission is much more fluid, you know, from one story to another. A storyteller will vary it, maybe even through the storyteller's own lifetime. Uh, there's no one canonical, canonical version like a Vulgate. Uh, and at any rate, since 1961, researchers have taken a different tack of building this a classification system, the ATU system, that based on popular story types that change and migrate from storyteller to storyteller, the basic line of Little Red Riding Hood with all its minor variations is cataloged as ATU 333. To the right, you'll see ATU 123, centered on an old and widely distributed tale called The Wolf and the Seven Kids. It's the source, ATU, a different fairy tale, is the source of that ending in the Grimm's version where the, they put stones in the, they open up the wolf's belly with scissors and put stones in. So in other words, uh, this is the way stories are blended and changed over time. But the conclusion that I come to, you could never prove it, I mean, not adequately to some people, but I think it's fairly evident and you also don't know, you know, what the folk version that Egbert, Egbert found among the peasants was, because he probably altered it with his own moral version of church. But it's evident that the basic story was there in Northern Europe by the early 11th century and probably earlier than that. So that is the medieval origin. One thing I've noticed is the folktale people don't bring in art history that much, but you can go a little bit deeper. Uh, but so what I can show you briefly is the common elements, the wolf, the woods, that red fabric, and it's made into a protective outer garment, whether wool as in Egbert or velvet as in um, the post-medieval Grimm's. Um, the commonest red dye in Europe from ancient through medieval times was rose matter. That's it on the left. Uh, the French word is garance. It comes from the extract of roots of rubium tinctorum, which produces kind of a reddish violet dye. You'll see that on the figure on the far left. That's a reconstruction of the burial garments of Queen Aragund of the sixth century as her, the corpse as found in a burial at Saint-Denis. Uh, it, it, red matter was the dye that was used in the Bayeux tapestry. Uh, so 
what, uh, what I think is significant about the appearance of the red cape in Egbert, it's not in ancient, you know, the ancient threads of the stories that went, may have gone into Red Riding Hood. Uh, well, in no surviving version is the red garment. It comes in with Egbert. And I think it's probably not a coincidence that his region of Europe, uh, Liège, modern day Belgium, and the northern coasts, uh, coastal areas of French speaking uh, regions, were what was then beginning to be a major northern European center of wool farming and textile weaving. And so the red, and that's, it's not a uh, coincidence probably that he's talking about the red woolen tunic as probably as it would have been pictured by the, the listeners, the, maybe the common people who heard the story told orally before Egbert got it, they may have pictured a fine woolen garment with a really high quality dye job of rose matter. Um, depending on what kind of liturgical vestments were available for Egbert and his students to see in the vestries of Liege Cathedral, uh, they may have he had a special glimpse on special feast days of an even brighter red fabric called Kermes. Uh, it was produced, there's sort of that upper picture in the center, it's kind of a gross picture that looks like mites. It's an insect uh, like cochineal that uh, produces carbidic acid. Uh, there's the coronation robe of Roger II of Sicily, a little bit later than Egbert's text. And uh, it is silk, and I, I have to double check. It could be that Kermes was more suitable to silk than wool, but at least, you know, there was the possibility of imagining something that was even brighter and more beautiful than even the best red matter. Mind you, we're not describing a red garment that actually existed. Uh, a special story tell and a successful story has to conjure something that's enough within its listener's experience that they can picture it and then imagine it even more so. A red so special as to have the miraculous powers of a Pentecostal baptism. The reddest red that anyone may even have been seen is stained glass. Uh, we don't have any of as early as Egbert, but the earliest surviving windows in Europe are Augsburg Cathedral, and there is uh, King uh, David, uh, late 11th century. And as for the garment, Egbert's text mentions a, a tunic, doesn't mention a hood, but there was such a thing as a hooded tunic called a gar garnage, and you can see them in this late 12th uh, century northern, northern French manuscript. Uh, this is the Fécamp Psalter. On the left illustration, uh, in the upper register and in the lower, you will see two sort of reddish garments uh, with a hood on it. So it's quite possible, though he uh, so Edward didn't mention the hood that the garment that this little girl was given did have a hood, or at least hooded garments were known. Perrault's version talks about a chaperon, and there they, uh, in other words, it was a short shoulder-length cape with a hood. They too existed from the medieval period. There's one also in the Fécamp Psalter. Uh, lower illustration, you'll see uh, the peasant, he's got that sort of shoulder length cape as, as a protective outer garment. And there are others that you'll find in medieval illustrations. Egbert's text is earlier than the earliest surviving bestiary manuscript. Um, and there on the upper face, the uh, upper illustration of the Aberdeen uh, bestiary on the right, you will see a figure wearing what looks to be a uh, chaperon. Um, Egbert's text is earlier than that, 
though Physiologus, which is one of the best dairy sources, was known and was translated into vernacular in Northern Europe in the 11th century. And it is sort of uh, one of, as uh, Asa Mittman said in the previous talk, uh, in a previous sound seminar, it was one of the sources for best dairies. Uh, the physio, unfortunately, Physiologus uh, entry on wolves is long lost. You have to kind of reconstruct what he might have said through Aesop, Pliny, Isidore of Seville, and other ancient sources uh, in compensation. But what I found is that the wolf, as Egbert depicted it, has certain behaviors that are consistent with what you hear uh, in what you see in the bestiaries themselves. Uh, here are two uh, short clips from the Aberdeen bestiary. Such is the wolf's cunning that it does not catch food for its cubs near its lair, but far away. And this is exactly what Egbert's wolf had done. Now, to bring into significance the importance of the wolf in a story that was really for the edification of young boys in a church school, here's what is the bestiary says. The shining of the wolf's eyes in the night is like the works of the devil, which seem beautiful to foolish men. So in other words, add Christian beliefs in moralizing to this story. It's no longer a story about a little girl at the edge of a forest encountering a beast. It's the beast is no longer just a forest predator, it is an incarnation of the devil itself. And that drives a lot of what post medieval European literature will say about wolves and certainly contributes to uh, the continued popularity of the story. Here's another example. This one is a sculptured lintel on the Palais Jacques Coeur in Bourges. It's dated 1443 to 54. It depicts the wolf on the left, the girl with a hood and a basket in the center, and there's presumably grandma's house in the woods on the right. In other words, the story has come together more like we know it than we saw it in Egbert two centuries before Perrault wrote it down. You'll remember that for Members Night in 2016, I gave a report on some research I'd done for an NEH summer seminar on medieval artist materials and pigments. Uh, I've remained interested in this, in this business of pigments, and it's part of what led me to Red, Little Red Riding Hood, but thanks to that talk by Asa, uh, I, and which sent me looking at, at bestiaries when I realized what he said about morals of the story, uh, the morale, uh, I realized that that was an important thing to look at because the Red Riding Hoods and all of the folktales have morals also, there's a great relationship between them. Uh, I realized subsequently that the real center of this story is the wolf, the red, red cape. Well, it's important for Egbert's story, but in uh, for uh, Perrault and for uh, the Grimm's also, it's what you call a MacGuffin, which is a plot device that may set the story in motion, but is really not integral to the rest of the narrative. Uh, what's important to realize is that from Egbert's period on, this is a period in European history when those old growth forests were being cleared. Just picture those videos that uh, we just saw in the previous talk. Uh, and, you know, as they talk about today with mountain lions and whatever, humans were coming into encroaching for agriculture, urban building, encroaching on what had been wild habitat. And we're in early medieval Europe where people really used and went into the forest. Now we're getting people who are living at the forest edge and the forest is becoming sort of an alien and an other habitat and kind of a liminal space. Wolves, such as you see it on this uh, lintel, I mean, it looks like a dog, but in really wolves were a real danger, particularly to small children. 
through the Middle Ages until quite recently, it turns out, France had one of the continent's largest gray wolf populations. Uh, and there, during several year, really harsh winters towards the end of the Hundred Years' War, packs of starving wolves were even prowling the suburbs of Paris invaded the city through broken places in the city wall and killed and ate 14 people in the uh, region of Momar. In other words, if you were out at night in the streets of the city, it was really dangerous. In fact, the, the attacks continued into Perrault's day, which certainly lent a special urgency. Little Red Riding Hood was not at that time a cute little bedtime story to tell children where everybody lived happily ever after. It may have become that by Grimm's time, but it wasn't in Perrault's time. It was a story meant to scare children. Perrault's publication changed the nature of the transmission of the story. Uh, up before that, as all authors, uh, all the three authors said, uh, it was a story that was told by the common people but that was an oral transmission, and while it would probably have continued, what happened with Perrault's day is that it moved over to a type of literary transmission. Uh, by the early 19th century, Perrault's tale had been read, translated into other languages, adapted countless times. On the left is an English language uh, version of couplets that closely follow Perrault, uh, published in London in 1810. Two years after that was when the Grimm brothers first published their first edition. They may have purported it to be German folk tales, but they too are part of the post diffuse transmission and diffusion. Their sources were a couple of young women, Jeanette and Marie Hassenflug. They were well-educated from a well-educated, very literary family. The mother of the family was a Huguenot refugee in the area. The family spoke French at home and they knew Perrault's publication. And so it was probably they, you know, who knows what German folk people may have had the ending. They're probably influenced by Perrault also, but it could very well be that it was uh, the Hassan Flug girls themselves who put uh, that um, ATU type one, two, three business about cutting the wolf open, stitching it up with stones. You don't, we'll never really know, but it's suspicion. Over the millennium, Little Red Riding Hood has grown and changed a lot and will continue to change. It's just, now what you've got here, I've shown you three comparative illustrations. The left, a French one with the little girl wearing a chaperon. The center one, Alfred Dinger again, little girl with the German red cap. And on the right, an American illustrator, Jesse Wilcox Smith, with that long red riding kick, uh, hood that it predominates in uh, English language versions. In, in other words, in UK and in uh, the United States. But one thing I've noticed is that the red cap uh, can also be found in... Uh, German ver in German and French versions, even uh, as uh, we'll ask if there's, um, uh, Evelyn shows me uh, a picture of a piece of lace she has with Le Petit Chaperon Rouge, uh, embroidered, uh, laced around the edge, but the little girl has a red cap on and a, and a dress that looks a little bit like what this little girl is wearing here. So, it has taken, it's a story that has amazing relevance. It can be taken in many directions, books, movies, songs, TV commercials, Halloween costumes, children's stories with cute endings, highly sexualized adult stories and fractured fairy tales told from the wolf's point of view. Uh, whether our greater ex a experience though of ecology and the importance of global warming and forests mitigating that. These days we love wolves, whether they're introduced to Yellowstone or wherever. Uh, wolves had been uh, eradicated in France at the beginning of the 20th century, and the Europe, but the European gray wolf is now 
thanks to conservation efforts now making a comeback in Belgium, France, and Germany. And if you can imagine meeting this one, if you're walking on a forest path in a forest in Poland, it might be a little bit frightening as well as remarkable. Consider that two years ago, a pack of wolves killed and ate an English tourist who was walking alone in northern Greece. She, we know what had happened to her because she used her cell phone to call home to England to tell us that she was, tell her family she was being chased by wild animals. And when they went looking for her, all they found was her cell phone and some bones. So there we come full circle. And I'm going to, with that, say thank you. And I'm going to stop the share. So. Amazing. Questions, folks? Michael Murphy? On mute. So we're going to use Susan's microphone so we don't get that funny okay. echo I had before. Have you have you looked at any of the writings of Bruno Bettelheim in this? Um, it's been a while since. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm so fascinated with this. I'm going to be uh, look again. Yeah, you know, Bettelheim is that one who sort of follows up on the more Freudian threads. Absolutely, and, and that's where I first heard about. Uh, fairy tales. One of the things that they say about Little Red Riding Hood, well, one thing you know I've learned as an art teacher is that they've documented that red gives us physiological responses. It's the color of blood, it's the color of fire, it's the color of danger. And when it's uh, viewing red, it's documented that there, the pulse quickens and your adrenaline level goes up. And so um, there's this aspect to it. And one of the things about Red Riding Hood, you know, the, the, um, the motifs from ATU 123, well, in first place, blood, sexuality, uh, that was there from the beginning, probably, it's, you know, in, even in Egbert's time. Egbert's story, there's not really a trace of it other than this little girl was innocent. Uh, the author who, um, one author who published Egbert said, you can be pretty sure that the folk version was a little girl. Because bear in mind that although Egbert was teaching little boys, if he had tried to change the story to a little boy, everybody would have said, that's not how it goes. So um, there's a kernel of it that's there and there's innocence. Um, but in addition, uh, the story one, two, three, which is also the ATU one, two, three, which is also very, very old, um, between the red and the, uh, the snipping open of the wolf's belly, filling it with stones and then stitching him up again. So he falls in, it bears similarities to, um, the ending, uh, uh other endings and you, it's very widespread, but it, linked to blood, uh, female sexuality. Egbert's stories, Egbert's tales, the primary uh, purpose of that book was to warn boys away from their own sexuality. So sexuality has been built into it from the beginning. And it's been suggested that ATU 123 is a metaphor for birth or cesarean or whatever. It's, you know, it's all mixed up. So um, I have to go back to Bettelheim and read what he says about this one in particular, um, but there's plenty of Freudian stuff in it too. Thank you. More questions or comments? It was so interesting, Linda. Thank you. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Oh, I had no idea it was going to be as deep as it was when I got into it. And you've got lots more to go on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to try some of the others, you know, I mean, because ATU crosses over uh, into, it's in, there is a collection of it in India called the Pancha Tantra. There's Aesop. Uh, this story, there's some of the um, stories um, from probably from Perot have penetrated 
into Africa. They're found in, in China where the, animal, where the animal becomes a tiger. Uh, they're just all over the place. Bob Niden with an update on the restoration of Notre Dame in Paris. You can see the title which says Rebuilding Notre Dame, an update. So um, it was about three years ago that I talked to you about the fire at Notre Dame. It was in October of 2019. Uh, the fire was six months old at that time. And quite a lot has happened since then. I think a lot of people have probably seen it in the news and kept track a little bit. And I've shared a few things uh, with you, uh, the articles in The Guardian and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, I guess we'll go ahead and review a few things about uh, oh dear there we go so this is what it used to be this is what we want it to be again uh, and this is the inside just as a reminder and this is what it looked like just about a month or so before the fire. They had built scaffolding all around the center spire to uh, rebuild it. And unfortunately, somehow or another, a fire started and it burned all day and all night. And this is what it looked like in the middle of the night. The fire, the roof structure has collapsed and the fire is still burning. Fortunately, most of it held up by the stone vaulting, which is what most people see as the ceiling uh, when they go into the church. Unfortunately, when the spire fell, it crashed through in two places, and there were a couple of other places where uh, it burned through the stone vaulting. In this picture, you can see right here in the north transept, one space it went through, there's a big hole underneath here and another one over here. Here, this reminds us where those big holes were, and there turns out to be one or two other tiny ones. It, about 15% of the vaulting collapsed in the church. And as a reminder, the only part that had that wooden roof structure over it is the cross section, the, the nave, the transept, the chancel, and apse. The rest of this is covered with something else. This is what the church looked like inside the day after. Uh, you can see where it crashed through the ceiling and there had burned timbers there. But the firemen fortunately had a remote control device which was able to shoot water in and put the flames out without endangering the firemen going inside to do it. So this is what the church looked like at the time I gave my last talk. They had installed these huge uh, wooden braces under all of the outside, the flying buttresses. Uh, they had put a roof up on the top, uh, temporary roof, big beams all the way across. These things were fabricated amazingly quickly and very accurately. Fortunately, these days we have computer-aided design and computer-run uh, milling machines. And uh, fortunately, France has a lot of skilled uh, technicians and carpenters. This is what it looked like inside as they were uh, cleaning up a few months later. They had remote control uh, little tractors and so on because it was still too dangerous for people to walk around in the nave because stones were still falling out of the ceiling. And you can see they've braced some of the columns they thought might have been damaged. So the president of France has put this man in charge of fixing things up, the general of the army, Jean-Louis Georges Laurent. And uh, I don't think he's doing any of the work, but he shows up every time there's something that has to be uh, presented to the public. And I think he's, he's at the end of the stick. The, the, the uh, government of France has passed a, a law, a rule, which says that the cathedral will be reconstructed identically and with the same material as the original. That is, the wood of oak 
for the framework and lead for the roof. We may not all agree with that. In fact, a lot of us didn't, and a lot of French uh, engineers, architects, historians, and other people thought they should do somewhat differently, but at least we're not going to have a swimming pool on top. So along with the general, we are following the rules of this man, Eugene Ville-le-Duc, who did the major renovation of the church in the 1860s. He's the one who designed and built the spire that uh, was such an iconic part of the church. At the same time, he essentially rebuilt uh, much of the inside of the transept. He refinished a lot of the um, chapels, uh, modified and installed new windows. So with their mandate, it's his work that we're restoring it to. As a reminder, this is what it looked like at the central crossing where the nave, chancel, and transepts come together. There's the framework, the uh, scaffolding, uh, got so hot that some of it melted, some of it deformed, some of it uh, ended up like this. So one of the first things that they had to figure out how to do was to get that out of there. It weighs about 200 tons and it's all interconnected. So it took a long time really to engineer out of that problem and set up the system to do it. And they finally started uh, taking it apart on the 8th of June in 2020. Now I would like to have done this all sort of chronologically to show you what has happened over the years, but a lot of things happen simultaneously. So we're going to sort of jump around, but um, sort of do things one after the other. So here is a picture of two of the guys who are cutting piece by piece these steel rods and bars out of there. Before they ever started, they put, uh, this is a close-up, it shows you really the damage and the horrible mess uh, that they had to deal with. You can see down here where I've circled, there's a saw cutting through that, uh, that tube right there. They installed these big uh, truss cross beams uh, to hang the guys from and to stabilize the whole structure. They put alarms on the whole structure because they were afraid that when they took things apart, it might jiggle and might all collapse. They were afraid what would happen is it would all uh, collapse to the center like a volcanic cone collapsing. So it, it was sort of a seismograph thing that they had and it went off a number of times. There would be cutting and something would move and the whole thing would go and the sirens would go off and everybody had to abandon ship. But uh, they prevailed. I love this shot. This guy has the best view in all of France. He's the crane operator. They work 24 hours a day to take down that stuff um, for about six or seven months. They had cranes from the north and the south side, plus the great big one over the top, lifting things out. This is the morning of the last day of that operation. And you can see they've taken down almost all of the scaffolding around. There's still a lot of burned bits sitting on the crossing. On the 24th of November, 2020, they declared that they were done uh, with the deconstruction. Obviously, uh, if you look down here, there's a lot of stuff to be taken off the top of the crossing. But what this meant was that they could seriously start on the next section of stabilizing the building and uh, then begin to clean it and then begin to reconstruct it. So a year later, almost, in July 2021, this is what the whole edifice looked like. The burned scaffold pipe tangle at the crossing is gone and they've put a protective roof over the whole thing, including a sliding roof section at the crossing, which allows the crane to dip down and take things out or put things in. It's just like a stadium roof. It rolls back uh, to open up that whole central crossing. They've also installed 
high rise scaffolding all around the outside to give access um, at all levels. There are some elevators in some of them. Uh, you can see all the places they put that in. Uh, then they've also had already put in these flying buttress gable supports and also these three places where there were gable ends that were hanging loose. And then they really got going. Um, they filled the whole thing with scaffolding. It's incredible. They built structures inside to hold up all of the arches so that they could work on the vault sections. They vacuumed and cleaned all of the vaults. And not, and not just that, they did some other work before they vacuumed it. This is looking up at that uh, opening ceiling above the central crossing. As a reminder, it's still a church. This is the apse end, uh, which uh, it looks, it, it could be permanent. It's an amazing thing, but you can see at every level there's a walkway so they can get to the inside walls, the window areas, the bottoms of uh, all the voussures, everything. One of the problems that they had was the humidity caused by all the water from the fire putting out and also the fact that it was open to the elements for quite a long time. So a lot of the vaulting and other stonework, which is limestone, absorbed a lot of water and the vaulting, the infill vaulting is a lightweight stone. It's much more porous. And they discovered that the water as it was evaporating and drying out was bringing any of the dissolved salts to the surface. And that causes the stone then to flake off and degrade. So they decided that they needed to get that scum off of the top, the salt. So what they've done is first they've cleaned it as much as they could. And then they have sprayed on a slurry of kaolin, which is a, a clay mixed with a very fine sand and deionized water. And they spray this stuff on just like they do drywall mud these days. Um, they First they cleaned out a lot of the joints between the blocks and then they spray it on and then uh, they smooth it over to what they claim is a half millimeter thickness. Which you can see them doing here. So they allow that to dry and as it dries, it absorbs, it actually adsorbs onto the clay, the salt and other bad things. And then when it's dry, they can actually almost vacuum it off. As I showed briefly, they did install arch supports. So this is the apse end before. And one of the things that you can see in one of the uh, infills is a place where it, it burned so much that the stone started to fall in. In my first talk, I talked about how the color of the stone can tell you to a certain extent how hot it got. So out in the area here, that's more or less normal. If it turns pink, uh, it, the impurities of iron form a uh, rust kind of iron oxide and it turns pink. And you can sort of see that over in here. If it gets even hotter, that iron oxide is changed into a different iron oxide and it turns black. And beyond that, the calcium carbonate itself self-destructs, it turns gray and turns into dust and falls apart. So that was one of the problems. They had to check every stone in the entire vault to see whether it had gotten too hot and had to be replaced. They did a lot of work. They took out stones all over the place uh, and stones had fallen. They core drilled them. They tested how far in the heat damage might have gone. They checked what kind of stone it was and where the quarries might have been. They discovered some of the structural uh, limestone, the harder stone, was the same as one of the bridges over the Seine is built with, and they knew where that quarry was. 
And there are nine quarries to the north of Paris that provide the softer stone for the infill. So just to make sure nothing would fall down when they're working on the ceiling, they put in, again, these incredible structures. Each one of these arches weighs about two tons. They take them in through the window. They've got these rolling dollies, and they roll them in, and then they have hydraulic jacks. They jack them up into place. It's quite amazing. Early on, almost from day one, they took out all the upper level stained glass windows for protection so that they wouldn't be damaged by the construction work. By a miracle almost, uh, none of the stained glass windows in the church itself were destroyed or even seriously damaged. They were covered with uh, lead dust, uh, and they were covered with soot, and many of them had not been cleaned for a hundred years or more. And the outsides, many of them had never been cleaned. So they took them out, they took them to laboratories to test what systems might be good to fix them up. Uh, this is in the laboratory, and uh, here's several sections where they've got them on a light table and they're doing experiments with different techniques and testing the old glass or the newer glass. Uh, they can check what the debris is on it to see how dangerous it might be and how destructive. This is what the outside of some of those windows look like. Um, and the insides weren't much better. This is in one of the chapels. The windows in the chapel were not taken out at first. Uh, they were either cleaned in place or taken out one by one as the chapels were repaired. But what I wanted to show you in this picture is the painting on the walls. And this is just a tiny section, obviously. But this is paint done in the era of, uh, and actually the windows as well, the area of uh, Ville le Duc. And Notice how carefully they've matched the colors, the blue and the red, uh, and they've done that a lot of places. So they are restoring all of these chapels. Now these, these colors are the originals, the ones that were mostly done 150 years ago. Uh, in many places, there are just tiny nicks and dings that need to be fixed. Other places, uh, there's a lot more damage that had to be repaired, uh, such as here. You can see there are cracks in the plaster, and some of this is old, uh, not necessarily caused at the time of the fire. But as long as you're doing it, you might as well do the whole thing. But they've had, you know, they've repainted, and uh, at the end, I'll show you some links to some videos. You can go. I discovered. But once YouTube just found that I was willing to watch videos that were in French, I suddenly got recommended a lot more videos about the repair of the church. Because there are a lot of entities in France that have made very detailed and interesting videos, but they're all in French or French with French subtitles. Uh, but the pictures alone are worth it. And sometimes you'll run across one that has English subtitles or English narration, and it'll explain some of the stuff. So this picture, uh, as long as they're in there investigating, they're investigating everything. They're cleaning everything. And what they found is that quite a bit prior to Ville le Duc, the inside of the church was painted. These are the colors, red and green and red, and this is cream, I think, some color of blue, a rose color. Um, and they had not known about uh, some of these, at least. That's a sort of a close-up. This is the West Rose Window, which, as I said, fortunately was not damaged at all. But the West Rose Window is hidden from the inside, to some extent, by the pipe organ. The pipe organ is the largest pipe organ in France. It's got over 8,000 pipes. And they have disassembled everything behind this front screen. They left the front screen with all of its display pipes, but they've still cleaned them all. Uh, they take the pipes out one by one and can clean them. But these things are enormous. Some of them are 30 feet long and weigh 
hundreds and hundreds of pounds, obviously. Uh, all, all this wooden casework all had to be cleaned. Uh, here they are taking out one of the pipes so that they can get to some of the pipes behind. So the pipes and all of the mechanism that they sit on that allows the keys to activate them and play them have been taken out and sent to four different organ manufacturers in within France, uh, some of them quite a ways away. And there's some interesting videos, if you're interested in that kind of thing, about what they had to do. You know, the insides of these things have leather glued in to seal the seams, and there's felt that had to be replaced, and all the pipes had to be completely cleaned. And once they're done and put back in, each pipe individually has to be what they call voiced, which means it has to sound in synchrony with all of the other pipes in its rank. All of the flutes have to have the same sort of sound and relative volume, and they have to blend with the the building and everything else. So that takes months and months to do that once they start doing it. Here's the console, which they disassembled and took out. Here it is going out a window. And there's a video of the thing being lowered down. There were four big container trucks of organ stuff carted away from the church. Now we have to talk about the roof and the spire. Um, before it burned down. The whole roof was supported by what they call the forest of oak timbers and beams. And when they proposed rebuilding it just as it was, everybody, including me, said, oh my God, no. Well, first of all, I thought it was silly to put something that's flammable up there again. But people thought that there couldn't possibly be enough oaks in all of France to do that. But that turns out to be not the case. There are a million oak trees in France, and they have been cultivated for hundreds of years very carefully, some by private uh, owners and some by the state. Uh, and it started, I think, because they make oak barrels for wine. So what happens is they plant them very close together so that as they're growing up, they have no room to move and they go straight and tall. By the time they get to be about 160 years old, they say, okay, and they start thinning them out. I mean, they may start thinning earlier, but they really thin them out. And the tree says, oh my gosh, I'm mature. And it starts producing acorns. So the acorns are used to start the next generation of oak trees. So here is one of these forests of oaks, and you can sort of see by the spacing of the trees and the fact that many of them are in line with each other that this is a cultivated set. But these trees are 150 to 250 years old, and that one that's falling from top to bottom is 40 meters tall. It's 150 feet or 130 feet, something like that. So here it is on the ground, and they're thrilled with this little kink that it's got in it because there's a place where they need that bend in a piece of wood and it's much stronger if the tree makes it than if they try and cut it out. So here is a little pre-trimming that the guy is doing, cutting away the excess branches. And I thought this was interesting. <laughs> this is from the 14th or 15th century an illustrated uh, manuscript, they're doing exactly the same thing. The guy, he doesn't have a chainsaw, but he's cutting away the excess branches and the guy at the bottom is chopping down the tree. I love it. So this is the roof section that has to be replaced. And you can see the cross section, the cross shape. So there's the nave, the transept and crossing, the chancel and the apse. This was not all built at the same time. And as I said, the transept was rebuilt in the middle 1800s. So it turns out that this section over the nave, the wood uh, they think is from about 1215. And it's hard to see in this picture, but it's still a pretty interesting picture. This is a before picture looking down the line. And the shape of these wood trusses is like this. And when you get to the crossing, these were built by Viollet-le-Duc. 
in the 1860 or so, and they have a different shape. They're similar, and they have to be. They have to, they don't rest on the vaulting at all. They rest only on the walls at the outside. And then when you get to the chancel and the apse, uh, here's another one looking down the forest. Uh, it's again a modification, a different shape that they've got. So the good thing is that they've got these wonderful drawings that Ville le Duc and his successors made of the church and what the status was and how it was built in exactly every single piece of wood that was up there. So if you do want to replace it exactly, you can. Uh, I thought it's interesting. The building is not straight. It actually does, it takes a bend in the middle. I think Canterbury also has a bend. Uh, that's an aside. So uh, starting in January of 2021, they cut down a thousand oaks to build not these parts, but the transept that is not shown in here, and eight especially long ones for the framework of this spire that they're going to rebuild, the flesh, they call it, the arrow. A thousand oak trees. So there's a fascinating video, which I'll give you a link to, uh, which shows them moving these trees. Some of these trees are 95 or 100 feet long, and they have to go from the forest to a sawmill. So they've got this, look at the size of this. So your average, uh, your average truck on the road, the longest trailer is about 53 feet. And these things are about twice that long. So I don't even know how they got them around the corner. But they brought them into this special sawmill, which was actually only opened in 2020 for a completely different reason. The guy was uh, wanting to make masts and keels for large wooden ships. But it turns out he has this wonderful bandsaw. The bandsaw cuts on the horizontal plane and it moves. So you block this uh, you block this thing onto a, a rest, and then the bandsaw moves through and cuts a perfectly level line through it. There's the bandsaw. There's the saw blade right there. It, it circles up around and around and around. And as, it, as the whole mechanism here rolls along, it cuts through. And at first, they cut slices off. So here's, they cut the slices, and then they have slabs, and they're going to make planks out of those. And then they put it through the saw again, and they cut off another plank until finally it gets down to uh, a log. Now, this woman is, I think they'll give you her title in a minute. Uh, yeah, she's in charge of the commercial use of the public uh, forests in central west Aquitaine. So what, I'm going to play that again. What she's showing you is that these trees, because they grew straight, have the most amazing, perfectly straight grain. Uh, just a second, you'll see it, I think. There, look at it. Perfectly parallel. And the advantage of that is, as she'll show you, it doesn't warp as it dries out. It stays straight. There's no forces to make it twist to the left or the right, just like that. So here is one of these logs that they have taken off both sides, and I think it's about 14 inches thick at this point. And so you can see there's a forklift at one end, and at the other end there's another forklift with a big sling, and here they put it on a single, <laughs> I, I just can't get over how big these things are. The logs, some of these logs, when they came in raw from the forest, weighed 15 tons. So when it was uh, bruited about that they might rebuild exactly as uh, it had been, Turns out that there's a bunch of carpenters and timber framers in France who already know how to do this. Um, 
you know, they're building, rebuilding a chateau and uh, down in the south of France. This is a three quarter size section of two of these frames, which they have cut and erected in a, a plaza in front of Notre Dame. Uh, and what they've done as a demonstration um, in 2020 in September, they they completely they made an exact duplicate of frame number seven, which is right in here, and they put it together out in front of the church and raised it up so everybody could see how cool it was. <laughs> so what I read is that 25 carpenters took um, a week to build that. And so if there are 25 of those frames in the nave and chancel, in theory, you could, in half a year, you could build them all. But there's a lot of other wood up there besides just the frames. In the meantime, in order to rebuild the spire, they have to put up another bunch of scaffolding and it has to sit on the central crossing. This new scaffolding is going to weigh 600 tons and they thought it might be a good idea to see if there was any uh, stable ground under there before they did that. So the archeologists came in and started excavating. They took off all the stone, which was heavily damaged by the collapse of the fire anyway. And they found some interesting stuff in there. Um, they found this, what, so they, what I've read, they are calling uh, heating ductwork. I don't know who put it in or when, but uh, it's there. It looks more like drain pipes to me. I don't know. Uh, they also found two lead encased um, sarcophagus. And just this past Friday, the Guardian uh, had an article, published an article that they have identified one of them and they know pretty much what the other one is too. They have taken these things down to the University of Troy uh, or maybe it's too long, I don't know, one of them and they've cut it open and one of these is from, they think maybe as old as the 14th century but it has no label on it. Uh, it unfortunately had been pierced and so the body had decayed and so on, but they found uh, flower decorations inside and remnants of cloth. And because the inspection of the, the skeleton showed that this man was a rider, they have called this man the Chevalier and they think he was from an upper level of society, but he died in his thirties. His teeth were in horrible condition. And he, they said at the end of his life must have been painful. The other body, which is not shown in this picture, I think it hadn't been unearthed when this picture was taken, uh, was a, a high church member uh, who died in 17 something or other. And his name was actually on a plaque on the outside. He was well-fed, well-dressed, and his teeth were in amazingly good condition considering the age and his age. He, he was 80-something when he died. So at any rate, there's one of the coffins. I think that's the old one. Now, one of the things that they, or one, uh, some of the things they found when they uncovered the central crossing were remnants of the jube or rood screen, which used to be there. It used to be, be between the crossing and the chancel to separate the nave from the chancel. These were taken down beginning at the end of the 16th century after the, uh, uh, the conclave at Trent, where they decided that the public should not be kept separate from uh, the, the, the chancel. So anyway, the one in Paris was taken down, they think, in the 1700s. But it was extremely ornate. So this is just an example to show what it might have looked like. But they found pieces of it buried underneath it. When it was knocked down, they just buried it in there. Um, some of them are pretty interesting. I love this. I mean, all the color that's still there. So that's about all I've got to tell you um, in my first go here. 
we're hoping to move from this to this in the next few years. They are still planning to be able to hold services inside the church in spring of 2024. They acknowledge that the outside will not be done by then, but um, it's pretty encouraging what they have been able to do inside. And if they can get the roof structure done and the spire up, I think uh, it, they might have a chance of getting some of this stuff done. Interestingly, I read that when Ville Le Duc built his spire, he built it inside the church and raised it up through the the roofs. I don't know how he could possibly have done that, but that's what this this showed. So, so not really Fien because they're keeping work on it. I'm I'll send an email that has all of these. Uh, links that you can go to. Um, France 24 is a great source. They have a lot of things in English. Uh, this first video is a summary that was just published in November, and it goes through pretty much everything I've talked about, plus a lot of other things, but it is in French. But the pictures are worth watching. Uh, this is a website, Friends of Notre Dame de Paris, and they collect money, but they also publish uh, updates on their site, pictures and, um, and some videos. This is the one that shows the trucks taking away these big oak trees, and it shows the sawmill in action. And if you watch the whole thing, you can see the general there and other people who are thrilled to watch this all happen. And then there are several shorter videos. Uh, this particular one uh, is about restoration in the chapels, and it has some really good pictures of the paint repair, but also how they're restoring uh, the sculpture and, uh, and different methods for cleaning. And there's one from the sculptor on site during restoration. There's one that shows in a stained glass workshop. And then this is a link to the uncovered tombs. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point. I think. Wow. Am I still shared? No, 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 you're fine. Okay. All I have to do is find myself. There I am. <laughs> okay. So. Virginia has her hand I up. I can see that. Go ahead, Virginia. Unmute, Unmute yourself. I'm trying. Okay, there. I got it. Um, so I actually have two short questions. First of all, that was wonderful. And the photos were fantastic. They were so clear and the resolution was so good. Where well, did you go I, I, I have a new computer. And I discovered that on the Mac... You can take a screenshot, you can take an edited screenshot, you can take a screen video. So as you're watching a YouTube, you can turn this thing on and collect part of it. Then you can shorten it, you can put it into your video. And I don't know whether it's a function of my computer or what, but those pictures that I just the still screenshots, Mm -hmm. Some of those were 13 megabytes. They were huge, wow. extremely, you know, dense things. They were PNG files. So I changed them to JPEG so that I wouldn't overload <laughs> Zoom. But uh, yeah, they're they're really, um, hmm. I was pleased with that. Oh, you know, the, I have, I want to share my screen one more, one more instant here. Um, <laughs> I have one more shot to show you. I'm not saying that uh, Serum Seminar is ahead of the game, but we are because on Wednesday, oh. Nova is doing my talk. It's not <laughs> me doing it, and I'm sure they have better graphics than I do, and the French will probably not be misinterpreted. But I discovered this today. My sister said, oh, that sounds like the one they're going to show on PBS on Wednesday. So I said... <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so great. Anyway, um, put that on your calendar for the effort of tomorrow. 
if I may, I have a real short question. So sure. where do they get all this money? This must be costing many fortunes. Well, as you might recall, when Notre Dame was burning, people started contributing money hand yeah. over fist from all over the world. And there are a couple of huge, huge donors, like the owner of Fendi, you know, the, yeah. the Italian, uh, uh, I don't know, big the, the company that makes things I could never afford to buy from, you know, belts that cost a thousand euro. Anyway, they donated, donated hundreds of thousands of euro and so did one of the big vineyard owners. And so they've got millions uh, okay. of euro to work with. And if you go to that Friends of Notre Dame website, they actually document a bit about how much money has been spent and how much money they expect to spend for the rest of the work. But yeah, I agree. Uh, I, just one of those trucks and the equipment to haul one of those logs, it must have cost, I don't know, $20,000. <laughs> it's amazing. So anybody else have a question? Thank you. I'll stand to silence. John, John Wilkes. Uh, uh, well, that was John. wonderful, right? I really enjoyed the uh, the mix and the storytelling. Thank you. Oh, thank uh, actually, you. I had a related question to Virginia. I sort of, are they short of money? I mean, are they constrained by money or is it, are they going as fast as they can under the circumstances, given the number of you know, people that can get onto the site or something like that? Do you happen to know? I don't know, but I, from what I read, they still have a lot of money. Um, and I, as I say, this Friends of Notre Dame de Paris is still soliciting money. But my feeling is that they have spent, I don't know, 34 million or 134 million euro, whatever it is. They're too big number for me, but that's not nearly all of it. And, but clearly they have a lot still to do. Um, so, have, you seen, have you seen any estimate of the total cost of the restoration? I'll, I'll have to send it to you. It's, it's, I can't. I find think it. we all want to know, though. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that in the I'd email. I'd also love to know that. how many people are involved in it. The, on the, Google, and the Google answer is 550 million euros. Spent oh. or raised? Huh? Is that money spent or money raised? Estimated. August, they had spent 150 million in August 21. The cost of the second stage is estimated at 550. So that's pretty close to 800 million by the time mm -hmm. you throw inflation in there. Right. Yeah. The billion no, I, dollar project. Yeah. But they're going to do it. I mean, obviously, they're not going to leave it half done. So. <laughs> um... uh, here you go. 865 is the present. 865 euros. <laughs> is, is, that's how much has been spent? Or? The estimated total cost. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Fabulous. Yeah. All right. This is a brief visit to St. Mary's Church in Woolpit, England. The town of Woolpit, um, does not get its name from sheep's wool, but rather from wolves. How's that for a tie-in? Its original name recorded as far back as the 10th century was wolf pit, for a local feature used to capture the predatory wolves. Over time, wolf pit has turn turned into a wolf pit. St. Mary's Church is a grade one listed building done in the 14th and the 15th centuries and sits on the site of two earlier churches. There is one door from the Norman church of the 12th century that still remains. It is now the priest's door into the chancel. The current tower and spire is the third one built for this building. The one you see here is from the 1850s, um, which had to be built after lightning destroyed the previous one, as it had done the one before that. What you see, you're now seeing the church from the back. You're seeing it from the rectory, which is how I first saw it. The rector is the Reverend Ruth Farrell, and she is a friend of mine. 
She's an Australian and I met here in Silicon Valley many decades ago. <clears throat> For the past 20 years, she has been pastoring churches in and around Bury St. Edmunds. As you're looking down the length of this church, um, the first thing you might notice, although it's pretty hard to see, uh, if you can see the little arched door with bright stonework over it because they just replaced that stonework and it's still white color, that is the ancient uh, Norman door into the chancel. But going farther, looking farther down, you want to be looking at that checkerboard patterned stone that is the south porch, a very <clears throat> important feature of this, this church. <clears throat> The South Porch was built between 1451 and 1474, and that is dated upon records of donations for its construction. It is actually two stories high. <clears throat> there is a small chamber on the upper floor. The five niches that you see across the front here would have held statues, which are, of course, now long gone due to various religious fervors of one kind or another that demolish them. Inside this, oh, and it just jumped itself. Inside of the church is this, of the porch, is this wonderful vaulting and with its bosses that I thought you would all enjoy seeing. And you'll also see the door. And in keeping with the times, there's a little sign, that white piece of paper on the door. It says, please wash your hands. When you step into the church and look down the nave, you are greeted by one of the finest of all hammer beam roofs with more angels than you could ever count. There are at least six angels on each tier and there are even more on the crest line. The two side aisles, and you can, you can see them on the, the, the slide on the left, picture on the left, are, are also full of angels. So uh, I hope somewhere, sometime, someone's counted them all. I asked Ruth if she knew, and she said she had no idea. The, of course, the angels were destroyed. Their images were destroyed during the Reformation and the Civil War, but they were restored in the 19th century. Please take a good look at the root screen, which you see in the, on the left, and then take a look at that amazing structure above the chancel arch. This is called the Canopy of Honor. It's painted in blue and gold. And we're going to talk about this later. And you need to keep this image of it in your mind. In front of the root screen is this wonderful Tudor lectern that was made to hold a chained Bible. It is still in use, minus his chain Bible. Um, it is one of only 20 still existing in the country um, like this. Uh, and I don't know if that reference means having the eagle or means having the capacity to hold a chained Bible. You'll have to do your research on that. On the far, on the far right there, you do see the, the back of that Norman door. If you take a look. Um, the lectern stands in front of the root screen, as I've already said, and has these brightly painted uh, saints on them. I'm going to show you the, on the dot over there at the bottom. There are four on the left, four on the right. And Ruth tells me that she's very pleased to have landed in a church where the, saint, the women saints equal the number of men saints in this location. The chancel is very simple, 14th century, with this window that was restored in, the 19, in 1962, and this very modern cloth on the altar there. The, and the, the slide on the, the view on the right is looking from the chancel back down the nave through that beautiful rood screen. And what you see, the window you see at the far end is in that 1850s tower. Now we're gonna look at this canopy of honor. 
uh, which I found very puzzling, very interesting and very puzzling and unexpected. Um, it's, it's painted wood. It's covered in angels, like everything else in this church. Um, they don't know. They're not sure where it came from and when. Um, they have images of the church from the early 19th century, and it does not appear in any of those images in this position. And they don't have images of the entire church. It could have been moved from somewhere else in the church, or it could have come from a different building. The local legend is that it was found in the barn of the old rectory, but no one knows that for sure. In the five arches, which you're looking at it at a weird angle now, of taking a picture straight up from the chancel arch, but in the five arches are biblical texts, and you see the angels below them. I hope you can see the details well enough they are each holding an object, and from left to right, I think they are an anchor, a cross, a triangle, a crown of thorns, a branched candlestick, and a book. This canopy is attached into the hammer beam ceiling joists there. I'm hoping someone on this call can tell me if they've ever seen anything like this. But while the hammer beams roof dazzle and the canopy puzzles, it's the menagerie of animals, real and mythical, on the pew ends that are simply delight. You see here two dogs, there's a close up, and then you see him in his position with his counterpart at the other end of the pew. You also will notice the, the wreath of ivy hung by the ribbons. Ruth is very busy catching up with all the weddings that got postponed during the pandemic. So they, the church is in, the prefer, in preparations for a wedding constantly this, this past summer. As you're looking at the pew where you see the docks at both ends, take a good look at the griffin behind and the pew behind. Here's a close-up of that, that griffin that you saw behind the dogs. And here's another griffin on a different pew. Um, I like to think that what you're looking at here, that these two are related. Um, you're looking at the newly hatched grandbaby of the grizzled senior griffin there. But I'm just making all that up. The entire church is full of these wonderful mythical creatures, mythical and real creatures. It would have been fun to have taken a picture of all of them. On our last slide, you see the church from the north, the north side of the church with the north door there. This church is listed in Simon Jenkins' book, England's Thousand Best Churches. If any of you have that, I think Elaine does. I think she's told me about it. Ruth also pastors another smaller church in the town of Druxton, which is nearby. We would read that word as drinkstone, but I believe they pronounce it something like Druxton. And again, there, they were busy doing weddings. Um, when I was with her, and it was July, she told me at that time that the cost to heat this church at Woolpit in the winter was 5,000 pounds a month. And I keep wondering, what it is now with all the problems there. I mean, is it up to 15,000 pounds? Nobody could afford that. Maybe there's no heat in the church this winter. So that is all I have to tell you. I hope you've enjoyed your very brief visit to this church. I was thrilled to get to see it. Ruth has been the pastor there for several years, and this was the first time I had actually been at the church. She's come and met me in London occasionally when I'm over there, but this is the first time I got all the way out there. I actually got to see both of the churches, so it was a, a great privilege to be there with her. Thank you, Evelyn. That's lovely and interesting. So, Virginia, have you ever seen a canopy like that? Um, I was wondering whether it was a minstrel's gallery, except I don't think it's in the right place for that. Nobody could get up there. Oh. I wonder who it's in order for. <laughs> I don't know if it's in.
Uh, while you were looking, Evelyn, I found there's an example of another canopy of honour over the chantry for treasurer Hugh Sugar from 1489 in, of all places, uh, St Cuthbert's Church in Wells. Oh, you'll have to send the link to that around. I will happily share that with you, yes. Or this thing just looks like the angels picked it up and flew it up there and plunked it in place. <laughs> you mm -hmm. wonder where it had been before. But given the angel power in that church, it wouldn't have been a problem to move a large object like that, I don't think. Can, can you, um, somebody must have been up there to see it in some way. I mean, does it have room for people to stand or sit in or? That I do not know. I'm. I'm working off the little tiny booklet that right. uh, yeah. the church has put out about itself and what it says in uh, the Jenkins book. Although he has some very snippy things to say about the tower. Uh, look up in the buildings of England, the Pevsner guides. Pevsner's the guides. Couple. Okay. It may or may not have anything. I don't know. Some think that perhaps it sat on the rude screen at one time. I don't know. Could always look. Did you did you look in Wikipedia? Oh heavens no! Oh, <laughs> they have so many things. It always amazes me. It's, I'm a big fan of Wikipedia. I am too, but I've oh. been crushed for time here. Oh well, yeah. Well, there's that issue. <laughs> <laughs> Other thoughts? I was nice to see a rood screen. Uh, when I was looking at the uh, the ruined Joubet rood screen from Notre Dame, I looked it up to see what, you know, I, I knew what they were, but I didn't really, I didn't understand why it had been disassembled. And so the Catholic churches in general do not have them anymore because this Council of Trent said that you should Mm -hmm. uh, allow the people in the nave to see what's up there. And it doesn't specifically say take down your root screen, but a lot of churches did. And I, it might have been the Wikipedia article that said that they mostly now exist in um, in England and in Lutheran churches. <laughs> sort of <laughs> interesting. But there was no root on that root, root screen in, uh, the, in no. your church. No, no, there isn't. Just the beautiful wooden <laughs> structure. And then the, yeah. the eight saints down there. With that, uh, with the book, that little sort of star vaulting on it, I was sort of thinking of a chantry. But since it's up so high now, my thoughts would be that if anybody from, um, you know, investigating the stonework of the church clearly, I and mean, how is the thing hung up there? I mean, that, would be for interest. that would be probably, I assume, Virginia, that would be informative to figure out what did they do? Drill into the wall, um, yeah. or no? Yeah, it, it, because it's kind of precarious. It's attached to the uh, hammer beam uh, beams. Oh, it is okay. Attached into those. Yeah. <clears throat> I well, I just be you know, an I addition. Whole thing, and it just I, my immediate thoughts were Chantry Chapel. I'm looking at Wikipedia right now. You may never come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Evelyn. I thought that was fascinating. I, I love that church. The decoration was fascinating. Good. The windows yeah. in the, in the yeah. clear story were such an unusual shape as well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things to look at, and it always amazes me that these little churches that you've never heard of and never think exist have this uh, startling architecture. Yes. The yeah, yeah, roof is fantastic. Yeah. Amazing to walk yeah. into that. Um, I'm yeah. so I'm really meant to see. Why and especially, uh, especially to have a tour by uh, the person who's responsible for the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she lives right behind it. In a new rectory that was built in the 1970s, she said, thank goodness they had sold off the old one because it needed all the restoration in the world. And they built this new one that she's in. Yeah. Evelyn, did she say anything to you about the history of it, how it came to be? 
built and preserved over the centuries? Is it a um, church of a manor house or some some kind of uh, aristocratic support that kept it going over the years? That is unclear. They themselves keep wondering about that. That at various times, or at some time, it was connected to uh, the structures, you know, uh, the organization of Bury St. Edmunds itself. Yeah, mm -hmm. which was a very rich abbey. So, right. And they do know that there were two previous buildings on that same spot. So. Mm -hmm. oh church there for a long time. It is at this time that Mary Tudor, Queen of France, favored sister of Henry VIII, not to be confused with his daughter Mary I of England, died and was buried in the Abbey Church. That's big time. The Abbey of Bury St. Edmunds. Uh, no. They're referring to um, St. Mary's as the Abbey. At Woolpit? Yeah, I think that's... I think there's a St. Mary's and Bury St. Edmunds as well. Oh, okay. All right. Huh. I think they, this is all mixed up then. <laughs> what? Wikipedia is a little mixed up? Oh, no. <laughs> never, never. Never. I was going to say that that pattern of the dark and light stones in the checkerboard mm -hmm. seems to be fairly common in that part of the world. Mm-hmm. But I, it may be Virginia that's mixed up here. Must confess. <laughs> yeah, I'm St. Mary's Church buries in Edmonds, so I assumed that was well put, but I think I got the wrong church. Don't blame Wikipedia this time. <laughs> blame me. Oh, someone's going to send us around the article home Treasures of Britain. Oh, that'll be wonderful. That's Dick Jones. Oh, thank you, Dick. Treasures of Britain has a short article on Woolpit, which I will scan and send to the Serum Distribution. Thank you, Dick. Mentions the features of the church, but nothing about the oddity of the root screen. And then John Wilkes sent us uh, a link to St. Cuthbert's. John, say what? Say more about that link. Oh, that was just—I just did a search for Canopy of Honor, and that was one of the ones that popped out. Mm, right. That was the one. They have a couple of examples above um, Chantry chapels. And I found another definition which defines canopy of honor or seal, C E E L E, sealier or sellure or sellure or seal, S A E L E, is a quote, rich colored, often gilded and paneled ceiling above an altar, chancel, chantry chapel, mortuary chapel, and so on. Mm, that sounds good doesn't say why it just says that's what it is <laughs> it, it sounds like you're just trying to emphasize something and make it more important by putting essentially yeah like maybe yes arch yeah. At it. well i certainly thought it was important it was fascinating to look at oh it's, it's a good totally church. unexpected hmm? it's a good church yes it's a beautiful church we should all have a field trip there indeed i'll, I'll go visit ruth <laughs> So, thank you to everyone. For thank you, too. Thank you. Fabulous talks we had tonight. Very we'll interesting. The Red Riding Hood. Mm -hmm. um, always good to get Bob's updates on what's going on at Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. He tracks it all so closely. It's, it's fabulous. I was so impressed with the images you had for that. Uh -huh. The French have been putting up these amazing videos, and the videos apparently are in very high resolution because I can take screenshots of them, and they're you know better than the camera I can take it with. So there you go. Well, just what I want to say about your talk, Bob, that uh, I've seen some uh, treatments on French TV, on BBC, and things, but uh, I always found it very confusing confusing and you made it really clear so thank you oh well, thank you mm -hmm. i i'm looking forward to see what nova does with it because they have a little mm -hmm. 20 second preview and they show things that i saw in some of these videos but i didn't really know how to work them in and of course they have graphic capabilities that are far beyond my even comprehension so i'm looking forward to seeing that too but they're 
introduction says it's going to be covering a lot of the same things that I looked at. So probably some of the same videos I used too. I don't know. We'll see. Right. Anyway, thank you all for your attention. It's fabulous. So we'll see everybody on the 9th of January. Okay. And what's the program then, Evelyn? Um, it's Alvin Lango on the Scrovinci <laughs> Chapel. Great. The Giotto paintings. Thank you, folks. Okay. We're going to have this meeting. Bye. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye. Happy New Year. Uh.